It's midday. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the Midday News Bulletin here on 3FM 92.7. The bulletin is coming to you also on all our social media platforms at 3FM 92.7. My name is Noble Crossbian and we're live to on 3news.com. Coming up in the bulletin this afternoon, Health Minister Kwiku Ajman Menu is expected in Parliament over the kidney dialysis issues. Also, alleged military brutalities meted out to residents of Garu and its environs to take centre stage in Parliament as the National Security Minister brief legislators on the matter this afternoon. We're live in Parliament shortly. Plus, we'll take you to Garu where residents say they are still traumatised by the event. And later in the bulletin, future spillage of the Akoso Mo Dam is a possibility after the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe, justified the VRA action, insisting all relevant persons were informed ahead of the act. We have details of these stories and a lot more coming to you shortly. Please, stay with us. Welcome to the program. We'll be glad to hear from you on any of our social media handles at 3FM927. Let's get into the details of the stories this afternoon. The issues regarding kidney disease management in the country continue to churn out reactions from the general populace as government appears indecisive on the issue. Following the reopening of the renal dialysis unit to outpatients, by the management of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital after a directive uh, by the health minister. Concerns remain arrive on the sustainability of the place, considering the cost component which the facility is requesting a review of. The proposed cost from 380 cities to 765.42 cities led to the immediate closure of the facility uh, though intensive care was being administered for serious cases. Reports say the available consumables can only last for two weeks. Now, a public health expert, Dr. Thomas Zanaba, is urging government to set up a fund to meet the financial needs of uh, kidney disease patients in Ghana, noting that most of the patients needing dialysis treatment have had to sell their properties to enable them pay for the treatment. Take a listen to Dr. Thomas Anaba. The total number of patients on dialysis as at October 2023 is 1,195. Some need just one dialysis a week, some two a week, some three a week. Three maximum. FM is it not possible for government 7. to intervene while they set up a fund like in other countries to help meet the needs, financial needs of these people? It is a fact that if you are supposed to have dialysis because you unfortunately fall sick of chronic renal failure, your family, your relatives would have to sell virtually all their property to help you live if you want to live for a year. Government knows this. Every citizen of Ghana has the right for medical care, any services provided anywhere. To me, I don't see it to be right for Kolebu to choose who to provide dialysis to and who not to provide to. If it's a matter of money, I think the government can find the money. We need, as a country, to sit down and develop a funding source with dedicated uh, income, a levy, or whatever it will be, whether from government, whether from donors, whoever, to rescue those who have end-stage renal failures. The voice of Dr. Thomas Zanaba speaking there. Well, the convener of the dialysis uh, kidney patient, Kojoba Fahinkra, has also been recommending government take some taxes off the consumables used at the centre. Um, because 32 euros, this, 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 it come back to Ghana. You pay import duties and then taxes on it. So government to look at the task component on those uh, these consumables is to try and scrap it off so that when they bring these consumables, it will go down and then, I mean, we the patient will we can pay maybe realistic price because once you put the charges on it, it will go up and when they bring it to us, we cannot pay. 
You hear the voice of the convener of the uh, Dialysis uh, Patients Association in the country, Kojo Bafo Ahinkra, there. Well, we understand that the health minister, Kwikwajime Manu, is in parliament at the moment. Uh, we'll be touching base uh, with a parliamentary correspondent, Kamla Kluche, for some update on what exactly the minister has been saying as he answers questions on the, uh, particularly the Kolebu Dialysis Saga. We'll be reaching uh, Kamla Kluche shortly but we're still staying in parliament this time away from health to some uh, security related matters because this afternoon we know that the minister for national security albert kandapai is expected in parliament also to brief members on recent military brutalities in the garu and tampane district of the upper east region the minister's appearance comes after the members of parliament for garu and tampane raised the issue of uh, military brutalities on the floor of the house when it resumed from recess last week tuesday now on saturday october 28 the military launched an oppression to ostensibly seize weapons in the two areas after a team of national security operatives uh, were allegedly attacked by irate youth groups the oppression led to injuries to some residents one of the said victims reportedly died from the injuries days later. The resident of since called on government to open an independent inquiry into the incident. Professor Junazuma is the president of the Kusog People's Congress. He has been speaking on the back of the happenings in the district, the military brutalities and the concerns raised by the group that the analysis or the aftermath of the incident giving by the military is not the true reflection of the case professor john azuma is a president of the kusog people's congress and he shared some opinions on the matter take a listen We'll find, uh, we'll bring you that soundbite from Professor John Azuma uh, shortly. He has been reacting to the happenings in the Garu and the Tempani areas uh, on the back of the happenings, the alleged military brutalities in the area. Uh, but first, here is the, uh, mem the District Chief Executive for uh, Garu speaking on the back of the happenings. We condemn the act because the attack that happened was an attack on the chiefs and the people of the area as well as we as district chief executives because we were not aware of their presence in Garu and Tempani. We will scale the petition to the higher authority and we'll be doing that swiftly. We will not be doing that alone but we will also follow up to make sure that authorities give it the attention that it deserves. You hear the voices of the district chief executive for uh, uh, Garu uh, speaking there. And after that was another concerned citizen of the area on the back of the happenings there. But now, take a listen to Professor John Azuma, who is the president of the Kusog People's Congress. We are demanding an independent inquiry into what happened in Garu and Bugri. And we want compensation to all the victims who have been brutalized in this incident. And we want those who committed these crimes, those who gave the orders, and those who came and did the beating, they should all be brought to account. You hear the voice of the uh, a concerned citizen in the Garu area, Professor John Azuma, the president of the uh, Kusog People's Congress, happening this afternoon in Parliament, is also the uh, National Security Minister Albert Kandapa, who uh, we understand will be in Parliament to answer some questions on the back of the happenings in Garu and Timpani, plus uh, the Health Minister answering uh, some questions also. We'll be touching base uh, with my colleague Komla Kluche, a parliamentary uh, correspondent shortly but in the meantime uh, some rather disturbing news there could be yet another spillage of the Akoso Mok Dam as to when at what volumes and the potential impact that is currently unknown even as the impact of the most recent spilling continues to hang over the heads of the 40,000 plus individuals both young and old who were affected energy minister dr 
Uh, Matthew Opokuprempe, however, had cause to justify the decision uh, to spill the excess water, arguing that it was the lesser evil in the grand scheme of things. I would never answer for things I'm not responsible for. I said the government has set up an interministerial committee that is still working. We are not out of the doldrums here. And that's when we finish. Parliament can inquire from them their report about how they, how they behave. We will do things that are necessary. That is a committee that has to decide. We will have a difficult time because where the flooding has been carried every year, after you know, there's a resettlement packages that are sent to them every year. And as soon as the water resides, the human beings go back to the side. And it's not because of anything, it's because of economic livelihood. You provide such shelters for difficult places. So I think the aspects will have to deal with it. You hear the voice of the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, responding to some questions on the back of the spillage of the uh, Akosomo Dam. But what do residents from there think of the act? Gordon Asidiba tells the tale of destruction in the village, a quiet village of Sekou, where approximately 200 houses have crumpled, compelling residents to seek shelter outside uh, the once secured compounds at night to be hearing from uh, my colleague godwin asidiba in a report uh, he filed concerning uh, the happenings in the Volta region the uh, Mepe area on the back of the challenges in the uh, akosumbo after the spillage of the akosumbo dam but is that the end of the conversation on relief and possible uh, compensation for the affected victims. Uh, let's connect now with the uh, South Tom Member of Parliament, uh, Samuel Okujito Ablakwa, uh, who was engaged in fierce debate on the flood on the floor of the House when uh, the Minister answered questions on the back of the happenings there. Uh, we'll be touching base with uh, Samuel Okujito Ablakwa shortly. Also, uh, Nanayo Akwada, who was the Executive Director of the Bureau of uh, Public Safety on the back of the concerns raised by residents in the affected areas. Already, uh, the Member of Parliament for the uh, area, for the North Town area, Samuel Okirotua Blackwa, he has been up in arms, if you like, uh, disagreeing uh, with comments over the lack of compensation or resettlement plan for the affected victims on the back of the uh, happenings there. Take a listen to what the Member of Parliament for uh, North Town, Samuel Okjitwa Blackwa, has been saying. Mr. Speaker, I am also totally appalled that in this entire state, there has been no mention of resettlement. How long are my people going to live in schools? Look, the indignity that people are suffering, are going through. 85-year-olds, 95-year-olds, we all have mothers, grandmothers, those of us here. Will we accept to live in a classroom even for two hours, for three hours? Why is it taking government so long to announce a resettlement policy for those affected whose houses have been destroyed to be resettled? There has been no mention of compensation, Mr. Speaker. The Member of Parliament for uh, North Town, Samuel Okujito Ablakwa, speaking. The, let's speak with um, Nanai Akwada, who is the Executive Director of the Bureau of uh, Public Safety, for some more updates. Ms. Akwada, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Uh, you, you've been following uh, the development on the back of the spillage of the Akosomo Dam and its aftermath effects. The, the, the water levels are receding now, but there's still question marks over compensation and resettlement plans. From where you sit, what do you make of all these happenings? Hello, Naya, can you hear me, please? If you can hear me, I'd like for you to unmute your microphone. Unfortunately, we're having some uh, challenges getting in touch with Nanaya Wakwada, who is the executive director of the Bureau of uh, Public Safety, uh, with some concerns over resettlement plans and compensation for uh, the victims of the Akosombo Dam spillage. But when we reach him again, uh, we'll bring you that uh, conversation uh, with Nanayo Akwada, the executive director of the Bureau of uh, Public Safety, 
speaking there. You're still listening to the Midday News here on 3FM 92.7. My name is Noble Crosby Annan. Uh, you can also watch us on any of our social media platforms at uh, 3FM 92.7 uh, on all our social media platforms. We're live also on 3news.com. Let's remind you of our top stories this afternoon. The Health Minister, uh, Kwe Kwajin Men, who's expected in Parliament over uh, concerns over the dialysis uh, kidney issues, will be touching base with our correspondent, Komla Kluche, also in Parliament. Alleged military brutalities meted out to residents of Garanit and Varans is taking center stage in Parliament as the National Security Minister is briefing legislators on the matter this afternoon. We'll be taking you live to Parliament, uh, plus take you to Garu, where uh, the residents say they are still traumatized uh, by the event. Plus, future spillage of the Akosomo Dam, a possibility after the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, justified the VRA action, insisting all relevant persons were informed ahead of the act. Let's touch base with uh, my colleague Komla Kluche from Parliament with some updates on the happenings in Parliament. Komla, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You've been in Parliament today. The Health Minister, who we understand, is in Parliament. What responses has he been providing? Well, Kukwajima Menu is speaking on the floor, on, on the arena of units and all. Let's, let's, just take, let's just take a listen to what he said. Kamala, unfortunately, uh, we, we do not have a clear connection uh, with you, but we'll, we'll be touching base with uh, Kamala Kluche shortly. But this as the here is the health minister Kwekwaja Menu on the floor of Parliament at the moment. Of companies for this massive philanthropic gesture, which has supported Kolebu and patients for the last six years. Just because, in view of these challenges, Kolebu has accrued a total debt of a little over four million uh, Ghana cities to its partner. Furthermore, it remains a fact that the current charge of 380 cities for dialysis is insufficient to enable the RDU generate enough revenue to fulfill its full obligations under the contract with FMC, especially as it does not have a hedged SA rate perennial regime. This has compromised the ability of the RDU to raise the funds required to pay for consumer goods procured from FMC promptly. So, speak again. Due to the high incidence of patients requiring dialysis, the total cost of care keeps rising, adding to the accumulation of debt. So, Speaker, it must be noted that current patients, currently, patients on dialysis are not on the National Health Insurance Scheme. So, Speaker, the Kulebu Teaching Hospital, in consultation with the Minister of Health, has initiated discussions with FMC for review of the current contracts for more flexible payment options and the more structured supply of consumables to avoid excessive delays and to ensure delivery of the outstanding 45 dialysis machines and auxiliary equipment to boost the service being rendered. So, Speaker, in the meantime, the RGU has been opened to the public since Monday, 6 November 2023, to add patients as directed by the Ministry. The MOH has since made a request to the Ministry of Finance to settle the total indebtedness of the 4 million Ghana cities. And the good news now is that the Minister for Finance has just approved the disbursement of this 4 million to support our patients in Kualibu. Way forward. To forestall the recurrence of this unfortunate situation, the Ministry, in collaboration with Kolebu and the Minister of Finance, considering one of the following options. The possible inclusion of dialysis on the National Health Insurance Benefit Package, the grant of subsidies based on proposal received from Kolebu, and the possible review of the tariffs to ensure sustainability of the services. And Mr. Speaker, it's interesting to note that the private health facilities charge between 800 
and 1,300 Ghana cities for just a session of dialysis. The decision on the options enumerated above, Mr. Speaker, will be announced as soon as practicable. Mr. Speaker, as part of our non communicable diseases roadmap, the ministry and its agencies will continue to raise awareness for prevention and early detection to reduce renal disease and minimize the burden on the renal units in the health sector. When this is realized, the total cost of care and the need for dialysis will be brought to the barest minimum. Mr. Speaker, government has invested with the support of Parliament by approving facilities for us in the construction of a 100 bed for Tramodian Urology and Nephrology Center of Excellence at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, which will be commissioned by the end of the first quarter next year, 2024. This is aimed at facilitating the provision of kidney transplantation services, among others. Mr. Speaker, this will further reduce the dialysis burden on the nation and the need for Ghanaians to travel abroad for these services. A local team has been trained to provide these services, I mean transplantation services, at reduced cost and have already undertaken the first few kidney transplantations successfully in country by our Ghanaian doctors. Mr. Speaker, I believe this is the beginning of the government's vision of making Ghana a hub for medical tourism. Mr. Speaker, I believe there is hope ahead of all of us Ghanaians. I thank you. Very well. That was the health minister, uh, yes. Peku Ajman Menu, speaking in Parliament responding to uh, the dialysis situation on the back of the happenings at the uh, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. We'll be touching base again with my uh, colleague Komla Kluti. Uh, he'll join us uh, with some more update on the happenings in Parliament. Uh, beyond the Health Minister's appearance in Parliament answering questions is also the National Security uh, Minister Albert Kandapa. He will be responding uh, to questions in Parliament on the happenings in Garu Antempani, the alleged military uh, brutalities of residents there that has raised a lot of eyebrows and uh, brought the military under uh, some severe levels of uh, scrutiny. Uh, my colleague Komla Kluche is joining us uh, at the moment. Uh, Komla Kluche, thank you uh, so much for joining us on the program. You've been in Parliament. Talk to us about uh, the happenings in the House, this time around the presence of the National Security Minister Albert Kandapa on the happenings in Garu and Tempani. Well, Albert Kandapa has been listed uh, to uh, making a statement on this. It's been captured in the order paper, uh, but I have not seen him in the chamber yet. Once it's been captured, it means that he is in the known and he possibly would be coming to apprise the House on the alleged brutality of the civilians by the military in Garu and Tumpani and its environs in the Upper East Region on the 29th of October 2023, following uh, some alleged attacks on some national security operatives by some youth in the area. Now, uh, well, even though I have not seen him, we, we are aware through the deputy my majority leader last week that the, the, uh, the civilian suspect who, who were rounded up and brought to a crash uh, and kept in the custody of the former uh, uh, Bureau of National Investigations or the NIP now uh, have been released and they they have they they've been sent back to Peru. Uh, we do not know what else the, the state of the investigations are, and all of that the minister is expected to to apprise the house with one of the things that. Uh, the MPs, especially the Zebila MP, uh, uh, um, is is looking for the Zebila MP is uh, a, a former majority leader, Cletus Savoka, is looking for is evidence that the 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 youth attacked the national security uh, operative. He said the minister must be able to justify that. Well, all of that we are expecting that. When the minister comes, he would make that statement in the past. We are aware, per the rules of engagement, a statement should not generate faith. That's what the rules of the House is. And so if it's anything to go by, he's only coming to apprise the House on 
what the fate of this particular incident is, and also uh, what what the way forward is uh, regarding investigation, if it's anything to go by. Right, uh, Kobla Kluche, thank you so much. But before you take leave of us, uh, what more will be happening in Parliament beyond the appearance of the Health Minister and the National Security Minister? Basically, these are, these are the things. I mean, uh, beyond that, we have presentation of papers uh, on the National Security Ministry, Minister of Interior, Ministry of Finance, Minister of Communication and Digitalization, Local Government, uh, Land Ministry, and also the Foreign Affairs Ministry. The only papers uh, would be presented and referrals will be made to committees appropriately. Thank you so much. Kamala Kluche, our parliamentary correspondent, updating us there. To some other subjects this afternoon, the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pokuprempe, has debunked claims that Ghana might be experiencing another period of doomso. He blamed the current power outages being experienced in part of the country on shortages in gas supply. He's been speaking at a press briefing in Accra. There was a shortage of gas. In fact, there was a shortage of gas. But how long did that power cut be last? And then I stay back on. And I said here, I didn't hide, that there's only one tube that is linked to almost all our gas fire demand. So if there's a shock, if it just so happens that an onshore receiving facility develops a fault, they cannot transmit a lot of our power. That is why we are having increasingly bigger stretches of the country going off electricity when there's a power shortage. But that power shortage did not even last for four hours. They didn't even last for four and we should understand. I cannot stand here and say that was the last one. And that doesn't make it do so. We all saw that even ECG announces that we will put off light here, we will put off light here, if we know a priori that this problem is going to be gone. But when you don't know and it happens, you have to tell them the truth. The only transmitter in this country will be people. And as it evaporates the energy, it knows where it is going to get it and where it's not going to get it. So if what he's going to get is shorter than the demand. He has to tell us so that I don't see any wrong in what we could do. He had the voice of the energy minister, Dr. Uh, Matthew Opoku Prempe, assuring the nation that uh, the country is not experiencing another phase of doom so there. Now to some education-related subjects this afternoon. Public junior high schools, they continue to grapple with uh, the challenge of lack of test books. In the last four academic years, course books in the four main subjects, maths, Science, English, and creative arts have been in short supply. Executive Director of Education Think Tank Africa Education Watch, Kofi Asari, says there's an urgent need for the finance minister to make allocations in the 2024 budget for the books. He was speaking at a Media General Star Ghana Foundation dialogue on education financing. Meanwhile, education professor at the University of Ghana, Jonathan. Fletcher says education financing uh, should not be left in the hands of government alone. He believes in order to achieve goal four of the sustainable development goal, which focuses on inclusive and equitable education, all stakeholders must come on board to support education financing in the country. These are the views of some uh, participants of the Media General and Star Ghana uh, Forum on financing basic education in the country. We have details of uh, these in our subsequent bulletins here on 3FM 92.7. Make a date with us on at 5 o'clock for uh, the hottest news bulletin, uh, hot edition also in our subsequent news bulletins across the day and on all the platforms of Media General. But that's how we wrap up on the news here on 3FM 92.7. Uh, my name is Noble Crosbyan and there's more news on our website 3news.com. Please do well to log on. Business News is up next. Good afternoon. gets busy on this frequency 92.7 3fm are you stressed from a hard day's work 
Looking to de-stress and relax over soothing music and soft chats? Then join me, Akofa, on Wind Down. 3FM. Keeping it cool, easy, nice and breezy like that. We're okay, kickstarting with Kenny Rogers. Write your name across my heart. Write your name across my heart. Every Monday to Wednesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And on Thursdays at 8 to 9 p.m. As I play your favorite songs on your favorite dial. 3FM 92.7. Wind down with me, Akofa. Your smooth operator on your way home. Smooth operator. gets busy on this frequency 92.7 3fm Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Business Daily. Coming up, government received budget support funding of over $102 million from the African Development Bank. Comprehensive strategy designed to address pressing economic challenges, foster sustainable growth, enhance fiscal consolidation. Also, ahead of the 2024 budget, Traders Advocacy Group Ghana calls for logging in exchange rates of the US dollar at the ports. We are expecting that duties and some of the charges and levies at the port will be scrapped. Plus, a bill. A bill to regulate restructuring and insolvency of organizations currently before Parliament. We are supposed to help companies to turn themselves around when they are distressed. And the law defines exactly who is a distressed company at all. I am Menu Afol. We'll bring you the details of our headlines and many more stories shortly. Thank you for staying with us in our first story. Ahead of the 2024 budget presentation, the African Development Bank, AFDB, has provided a budget support in excess of $102 million to government. This grant is expected to show up government revenue for the 2024 fiscal year. Speaking at a signing ceremony between the Finance Ministry and the AFDB, a Deputy Minister of Finance, Abinal Sayasari, said the support will complement efforts at reviving the economy. This grant signifies more than just financial assistance. It represents a boost of confidence in a partnership built on trust, shared objectives and a firm belief in Ghana's prospects. Today we are deepening this partnership with a sign of an agreement between the Government of Ghana and the African Development Bank for the implementation of the budget support program agreed. This program is a comprehensive strategy designed to address pressing economic challenges, foster sustainable growth, enhance fiscal consolidation, and promote inclusivity within our society. We are therefore dedicated to harnessing this potential for the benefit of all our citizens. We acknowledge that the success of this program hinges on effective collaboration among our government's development partners the private sector, and the civil society. That was a Deputy Minister of Finance, Abna Osei Asare. Meanwhile, Country Manager of AFDB, Fasika Jerusalem, pledged the bank's continuous support to Ghana. She said the budget support grant for Ghana complements the IMF Extended Credit, credit Facility. These ongoing projects, in addition to uh, the budget support program we are signing uh, today, will support government's recovery and development efforts and contribute to the bank's high five strategies in Ghana. So we will light up and empower Ghana, feed Ghana, industrialize Ghana, integrate Ghana, and improve the quality of the life of Ghanaians. Honorable Deputy Minister, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
We are confident that the government will remain committed to the reforms identified in the program as to take full uh, advantage of it uh, to address the current uh, difficult conditions faced uh, by the country. Fasika, a Wusalemis country manager of the AFDP. Away from that, in just a few days before the presentation of the 2024 budget, the Traders Advocacy Group Ghana, TAG, is urging the government to consider logging in exchange rate of the US dollar as the country's ports for the upcoming year. TAG argues that such a move would not only facilitate its members' business planning, but also improve tax compliance at the ports. There's more in the following report. Throughout this year, businesses in the country have grappled with numerous challenges stemming from the current economic conditions. These challenges encompass soaring inflation rates, high borrowing costs, and the depreciation of the local currency. These factors collectively underscore why the Traders Advocacy Group Ghana TAG emphasizes the need for the government to foster a conducive environment for businesses with a critical examination of the country's tax system. We are expecting that duties and some of the charges and levies at the port will be scrapped because like the COVID levy should be should just finally to like the uh, internet, I mean, network charges. What, what is that? Those things should be scrapped. When that is done, those will start coming down. TAG also stresses the importance of addressing the adverse effects of the depreciation of the Ghana city on their operations. In this regard, they propose a solution to mitigate the impact, particularly at the ports. We are expecting that duties and some of the charges and levies at the port will be scrapped because like the COVID levy should be should just finally to like the uh, internet, I mean, network charges. What, what is that? Those things should be scrapped. When that is done, those will start coming down. That was a report by my colleague Michael Obudu. Also, a bill to regulate restructuring and provide advisory services on insolvency of organizations is currently before Parliament for consideration. When passed into law, the Chartered Institute of Restructuring and Insolvency Practitioners will ensure that both private and state-owned organizations operating in the country are fit for purpose. President of the Ghana Association of Restructuring and Insolvency Advisors, Garia Felix Addo, made this known at a business rescue seminar organized by his outfits here in Accra. Under the law requirement, the serial law requirement, that Ghana will be a chartered statutory back organization. Currently, we are a non for profit professional association. Okay? Under the bill, Garia will be a standalone, very similar to the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Institute of Bankers and the like. Okay. We have our governing board. We have structures which will tell us how we operate, how we do things. But most critically, we have objectives. And objectives will tell us that we are supposed to help companies to turn themselves around when they are distressed. And the law defines exactly who is a distressed company and all. We also, let me mention that in the, in the current bill, we're supposed to also assist state-owned enterprises which are currently distressed. Okay. So yes, we move from the private sector to also the state-owned enterprises. The whole purpose is that at the end of the day, companies will be fit for purpose. Felix Addo is president of the Ghana Association of Restructuring and Insolvency Advisors. Meanwhile, senior management at auditing firm KPMG, Julius Ayivo, said haircuts under the debt restructuring exercise are beneficial for the turnover of struggling companies. In an interview at the Business Rescue Seminar organized by Garia, he said government's debt restructuring exercise was a necessity. The one that is getting a haircut would definitely be at some losing end. However, when you look at it, on a, on a global basis, it may be more beneficial to the person. So for instance, let's look at a business that is struggling you know, that, and has creditors that the business owes so much. If you don't accept a haircut, you may even end up losing the entire of the amount that you, that you are owed. So sometimes haircuts are 
extremely, extremely important because when haircuts are, are given, it gives the business enough space, uh, the people in the public sector will, will tell you, uh, fiscal space, you know, to be able to operate. You have the voice of senior manager of KPMG, Julius Ayifo. Now, an economist, an economist with Louisiana Economic Development in the USC, Dr. Saad Idrisu, has expressed his support for former President John Muhammad's vision of a 24-hour economy in Ghana. The National Democratic Congress presidential candidate for the 2024 general elections has proposed a plan to transition Ghana's economy to one that operates around the clock, breaking away from the limitations of traditional working hours. The leader and 2024 flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, recently indicated that a new NDC administration will work to introduce a 24-hour economy with incentives and tax breaks for manufacturers who will run extra shifts to create more room for employment. Describing the plan as a game-changer, Economist Dr. Saad Idrisu said this will improve standard of living in the country. A lot of advanced countries almost all run on a 24-hour economy. Number one, you could talk of employment opportunities. More businesses operating more hours will need more people, so definitely employment will be created. Government will have to employ more people into our security forces to patrol night and all that, so that is employment as well. The government will have to extend electricity to so many areas. We can talk of reduction in traffic. Different west schedules will mean different traveling times or different commute times, so traffic will be reduced. Dr. Saad Idrisu, however, urged proper consultation into the initiative to avert possible surge in crime rates. If you don't implement it well, then you are going to have a disastrous crime rate, especially at night. Without proper consultations with religious leaders, chiefs, uh, community leaders, some cities may kick against it because they may not understand the whole idea. So proper consultation is needed. That was a report put together by my colleague Bismarck Awusa. Now that will be all for Business Daily. For more business stories, please check out our website, 3news.com. I am Menu Afo. Do stay tuned for more stories.